Hi, my name is Jamie Lombardi, and it is my pleasure to moderate our round table today. Um, we will be talking about fear, confidence, and risk in the context of our global pandemic. It is interesting to wonder about fear in this context of a health crisis, whether it is irrational, instrumentalized, pure for survival instinct, or even positively mobilizing effect, and how it influences the construction of our societies. Fear questions in particular the conception of the state, which embodies unity and protection. This contract of submission mentioned by Hobbes, which entails consent to the sovereign in exchange for security, how to accept this risk-taking and maintain this contract of confidence in the face of a weakened political response, which fails to understand and respond to the crisis of our time. Our first panelist today is Tanella Boni. Um, she is an Ivarian writer, philosopher, and university professor. Her poems and philosophical essays focus in particular on how women and men can live as humans and maintain their dignity in the face of violence. Her book on what are the women of Africa going through is about the place of women in Africa, feminism, and strategies of resistance and women's revolt. In 2005, she won the Amadou Karumo Prize for her novel, Martins de Couvre-Fou, Curfew Mornings. My apologies for mispronouncing that. And in June 2009, she received the Antonio Vicaro International Poetry Prize at the 27th Poetry Market. Tanella, I open it to you. Tanella, are you with us? Uh, yes. OK. Um, would oui, you... je suis là. Merci, je I'm with you. Yes, thank you. Now, first of all, I would like to thank UNESCO for inviting me to take the floor uh, for this uh, uh, philosophy day on an issue that is of concern to all of us. Now, I would like to um, see if I can start my video. The video is on. Yes, I think the video is on. So the question is, or rather the question I would start with, is uh, how can we uh, go beyond fear? Uh, how can we... Uh, uh, build a world and rebuild ourselves, we can wonder whether there is anything new if we compare COVID-19 to other pandemics, other uh, contagious diseases are expanding, such as uh, uh, Ebola, AIDS, dengue in Africa, for instance. However, these epidemics are experienced differently in the regions of the world. So let me go back uh, to the context of the present pandemic. Early in 2020, COVID-19 seemed far away. Something was going on in China. We didn't quite know what, and when you don't know what is happening, you get the feeling that something is happening in one region of the world that leads to fear of what might happen to us. We tried to fight that fear initially, and we heard uh, some say this is a Chinese virus. I might even say that a well-known president, the uh, outgoing president of the United States, conspicuously called it the Chinese virus. However, this unknown invisible virus ended up crossing all the borders of the world and invaded the planet. And we are continuing to seek for the means uh, to uh, fight off uh, this uh, invader. Uh, we're looking to uh, vaccines, uh, which are one uh, method to uh, fight a pandemic. Uh, but are they really reassuring? A part of the fear surrounding covid 19. Initially, there was a surprise when the disease first appeared, and then there was the uncertain management of the pandemic situation. Then you have imagination kicking in. Uh, the ability of the virus to disorganize our world leads to fear. But what are we talking about? 
the propagation of the virus is out of control and fear becomes increasingly complex. But if you look at the facts, then that will even aggravate fear. Uh, there is a drop in human activities, uh, uh, no more flights, uh, deserted airports, closed borders, etc. Within uh, homes, there is less movement and life is movement. It is an activity of the human body. It is moving from one place to another and a human cannot live in isolation. Uh, a human being must be related to other human beings and therefore take the risk of building bridges uh, and corridors. All of uh, these activities uh, are part of uh, cohabitation and this is what is at stake. So the virus is unknown and it is uh, frightening uh, us and undoing the world we know uh, day after day. To understand what this fear is the name of, we need to look to the facts, the discourse and the images uh, that have uh, been shown everywhere. The great tale of COVID-19, which I will not tell you because I believe that we all know it full well. But I believe that it all begins uh, with uh, uh, a loss of uh, uh, our references. So we are lost in an uncertain world. Uh, this is uh, uh, a new situation for us. There have been other pandemics in the history of uh, humanity, but the world was not as it is now with the means of communication, uh, the uh, development of science, uh, technology, the uh, progress of medicine, uh, social uh, media and so on. So the question is what happens to humans affected by the crisis uh, that has led to a, a, a break in the linear uh, nature of time? Humans have memory. We remember that there was yesterday. We know longer what today is about or whether tomorrow will arrive. It is therefore the very notion of time which is questioned. It no longer is what it was. We get the feeling that uh, uh, the space where we live is transforming. And in order to live somewhere, uh, human beings need references in space and time, without which we are lost in an uncertain world that we no longer recognize. So insecurity, another name for fear, as far as I'm concerned, is now part of our lives. And we are afraid of insecurity. We're afraid of fear and of rising fear, uh, the fear that stops us from sleeping, despair, suicidal ideas, etc. All of this uh, is part of uh, fear. Uh, it is a vicious circle. Uh, to quote uh, Descartes, uh, for instance, fear or terror uh, and they both come from the same Latin word pavor, uh, which is a sudden fear. The sudden and violent fear is the uh, passion of uh, the soul resulting from the surprise uh, relative to a sudden event. So to avoid it, you need to prepare for events that can be feared. And what surprises humans is what they did not anticipate, what they did not expect. And we can uh, only uh, think of uh, stoicism, uh, constant, uh, unperturbed, uh, as uh, Seneca says, uh, uh, the wise uh, man is never surprised by what happens. He knows that he may be rich one day and lose it all the next morning and he will remain himself. He has therefore no fear uh, and especially no fear of death. His true uh, country is the world, not society in which he lives under the uh, eyes of others. But as one might uh, understand, in the 21st century, the unpredictable is part of our world because uh, sickness and death are part of it and living is taking a risk. It's having the courage to resist 
uh, to stand up to the threats, in particular the threats to our health. Should we also take the risk of losing our freedom? And this leads me to my second um, aspect, politics and the feeling of insecurity. If fear is born uh, of the absence of anticipation, the lack of courage to face facts, it then grows. Facts and imagination, representation of facts are uh, the cause of a constant fear uh, which invades our bodies and minds. And this is the feeling of insecurity. It is uh, precisely uh, in terms of preserving health that insecurity grows. But what is health? We do not know. The rumors in the world, the uh, various uh, uh, discourses and what we hear on social media as to the state of the pandemic and its management uh, by politicians are increasing our uh, feeling of insecurity. The state wants to play its role to protect citizens. Uh, you can see how scientists and experts in physical or uh, psychological health have become the advisors of uh, politicians. And we should look to Plato, uh, who imagines that the philosopher can be the safest and surest ally of the government. But the alliance we see now is an alliance between the management of public and uh, political management of uh, care. And this can lead to an aggravation of uh, fears. This biopolitical alliance, as one might call it, is uh, accepted diversely according to countries, cultures, and beliefs. And the loss of trust is here between uh, politicians and the citizens whose health they try to manage. If you do not uh, believe in uh, politicians, uh, then you can have the illusion of preserving your individual freedom, but you could compare countries and show that not all humans in all countries are afraid of losing their place in the world or afraid of dying because of a lack of activity, movement and displacement. In some countries, the reaction is different. Uh, there is uh, uh, good humor, there is uh, uh, information. Uh, uh, we can uh, take the example of the president of Madagascar, who found a, a potion uh, based on the Artemisia plant. So we tried also to use artistic creation, uh, uh, music, painting, uh, uh, the creation of words in many African countries. Uh, there is uh, a hairstyle that is now called the Corona hairstyle. So we try to uh, look after what remains in the face of this pandemic. So facing change to inhabit the world, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, has taught a us a lesson in life because we're not equal facing this pandemic. We have no choice. We have to face the new world in which the old inequalities have uh, uh, continued, and they are a greater threat than the virus itself. And there are countries that are not very visible on the global scene, and yet they are fighting. And yet humans, uh, accustomed to all sorts of disasters, have uh, learned how to manage their uh, being together differently, and they probably have a, a very different idea of managing uh, uh, health care. They still trust what nature has to give, even though we might wonder uh, for how long. But who are we? We learn uh, in this situation that uh, the human body is uh, perishable and not uh, mortal, and Heidegger made a difference between uh, an object and the human body. The object is perishable and the human body is mortal. Uh, but our world is being saturated by images and words explaining how the human body, fragile, um, incapable, such as being in a coma, an artificial coma, uh, or uh, enhanced by uh, medical appliances, uh, becomes just an a mass that can simply be deposited when it stops breathing, uh, buried uh, uh, in, in silence and discretion, and the body 
even when it has become just this mass, uh, continues to think, has a spirit, uh, the body loses its dignity of human body. And the human watching the images uh, remembers that his face has lost uh, its dignity. Uh, uh, what distinguishes one human from another human? Uh, faces have been hidden by the uh, uh, health emergency, the fear of contamination. Uh, and what is at stake is preserving links between human through collaboration, cooperation, solidarity between humans and non-humans, between the rich and the poor, the in included and the excluded. Uh, and we need to rethink these concepts to find the courage to face these changes and to uh, try to forecast what can happen to humans and to undo the world, to rebuild a fairer uh, world, uh, to uh, make sure that we can all live together. Thank you. Thank you, Tanella, for that. Um, I would like to um, remind those who are participating with us that you are free to ask questions um, that I will be happy to, to read to our speakers. Um, but to get us started, you make, um, you make a point about how human, need, human beings need um, references in time and space in order to navigate. And that's been one of the things that, at least for myself, I found so difficult um, because we're, we're mostly at home, our time and our space all sort of blends into one another. So I was curious if you had any suggestions on that to how we could find those reference in time and space. So how do we recover our references? I think that first we need to find the means to fight fear. What is leading us to lose uh, sight of our references is the fact that we imagine the feeling that all is lost, that we are locked up, that we have, for instance, lost our freedom. And this is something I didn't really highlight, but I feel that we need a lot of courage. And I know that courage is not heroics. It is not the hope that you're going to do something at a given point in time, and then it is all over. Courage needs time. That is also the, the paradox. In order to... Um, uh, recover our references, it is almost as though we needed to uh, find ourselves again and not fear ourselves so that we can see better what is happening around us. And that is when I think that we can uh, uh, find our references again. But again, I'm, I'm wondering whether when we find references again, they will be the same ones we used to have before the pandemic. And that's a different issue. But I think that we need to accept that we will have new references to build because we will have had the courage to um, face the need for change. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for that. I um, am going to read some of the questions that are Merci. coming Je vais dire certaines questions qui nous sont, sont arrivées. Um, so we have a question from Amory Montadon, and um, they ask how to explain this uncertain confusion in a world where information rains and goes faster and faster, where we only move back to the inevitable by trying to anticipate as much all possible disasters. You're muted. Tanella, we can't hear you. Your, your microphone is muted. Yes, I see. Yes, yes. 
It's okay now. Oui, est-ce que ça va là? Can you hear now? Can you hear? Oh, I can, yes. Uh, I'm not sure I, I caught the gist of the question that was asked previously. Could you repeat it rapidly, please? Yes. So the, the, the question was um, how to deal with the, the nature of fear when so much of the information that we're getting comes and goes so quickly. And it seems that the nature of what we're dealing with is, is constantly in flux. Yes, indeed. Our time is a time of velocity. Everything that happens on social networks, among others, goes very fast. And not only on social networks, everything that I call the noises of the world, they come from everywhere. You have the most uh, uh, threatening news, all these videos uh, uh, on the internet. But once again, I think we should perhaps think we still have a, a reason, a mind. We have to go back to ourselves, because if we don't know what we're talking about, then we won't be able to confront the threat in ourselves, even though we might uh, still believe that we are nothing, we're completely beaten. I said we were paralyzed or petrified in my text. When you're petrified, you can't move, you can't do anything at all. But I think it's precisely in that particular time that you can uh, bounce somehow and get back up. Maybe I'm one of those who believe in the idea of resilience, the concept of resilience. And I say that perhaps the more you feel beaten, uh, maybe the more you are able to bounce and get back on your feet in order to be able to face reality. Because if we cannot rely on our own uh, forces, we won't get back on our feet. And where do you find uh, your strength? Well, in France, uh, there is a, this discussion on the reason why bookshops should be closed is not, are not books essential goods, for instance. And I'm one of those who believe that books, for instance, are more than important. And there are countries where there are no books, but you have speech. And you have words of peace, words which bring peace, uh, stories that are told, other narratives which can help us construct the world, which help us get back on our feet and look and face what is happening, what is happening to us and what is happening to the world. Thank you. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. We've got about five more minutes. So I think we have at least time for one more question. Um, and this one is from an anonymous participant, but they ask something um, more practical. They ask if you could elaborate um, on ways that fear can be mitigated in African countries. Is the notion of fear um, linked to our cultural context? I think that we don't fear in the same way. Uh, according to where you are, your country, Aristotle said that you have to take things uh, in different meanings. Everything should be taken from different various angles. Of course, there are different kinds of fear. And whether you're a man or a woman, for instance, you don't fear in the same way, whether you're a young person or an elderly uh, citizen and so on and so forth. So, of course, that is true. According to what we know, our knowledge, our culture, our beliefs, fear may take different forms. So what we actually call fear does not amount to a single essence of fear, if I may say so. It all depends on our own uh, cultural resources, religious 
resources, and even more than that. It also depends on our own environment, the society in which we live, the community in which we are, our family. But I will add another term to that, which I believe might summarize what I've been thinking for a while. It depends on the way in which we live, we inhabit the world, uh, inhabit in the sense of appropriating what is around us and being able to face uh, all the threats and dangers, uh, try to meet challenges with what we are, with what we think, and try to see where we can go with what we are and what we have, and try to see how we can have a dialogue with those who don't know us. So I just wanted to say simply that there is not a single fear, one uh, fear for all. There are various types of fear. There are various levels of fear. And also that depends on what we are and how we learned. In my mind, there's always the idea of the learning process, education, and so on and so forth, because I think that nothing happens overnight. And as you know, and as Aristotle said, a sparrow does not make the spring. We need time, especially uh, when we lack time. We know that uh, in pandemic, uh, in the pandemic, what we lack is actually time. Thank you so much for that, Tanella. I really appreciate your time this morning and for your remarks um, that you've, you've given us a lot to, to think about. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our next panelist, um, Luc Fonu. Luc Fonu is a French philosopher. He is a specialist in modern and contemporary political thought. He is the research director at CNRS. He is a member of the Raymond Aaron Center for Sociological and Political Studies and teaches at the School of Higher Studies in Social Sciences. He devoted his doctoral thesis to a little studied aspect of the theory of power according to Hobbes. His conception of omnipotence, stressing both the importance of the notion of the absolute power of God in a philosopher considered to be an atheist, and the link between this notion and the main concepts of the moral and political philosophy of the author of the Leviathan. In 2001, for the publication resulting from his thesis, he received the grand prize from the Association of Professors and Lecturers of Sciences in Paris. He is today one of the recognized scholars of Hobbes' work, which he has translated into French and has commented on. Luke, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, in Paris, uh, it's the afternoon, so we're not on the same continent, oh. but it's, it's good. Thank you for your, your presentation. And also, I, want, I wanted to, je voulais plutôt uh, commencer. Puisque uh, parle... Well, you, you, were, you were speaking English, so I wanted to answer in English. But first, I'd like to thank uh, UNESCO for inviting me to speak today. And I am really happy that I could uh, 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 listen to Professor Bunny uh, at the beginning of this round table. Now I'd like to uh, throw a few thoughts around a seventh century author whose topicality remains very great for us today. I will try to show why uh, this author might help us to uh, reconsider relationships between fear, trust, and risk. And I'd like to ask, uh, also, to add also another thesis. When we go through a time of uh, epidemics, as is the case for us, and has been for a number of months, uh, we are faced with really new conditions, uh, what went, uh, what self-evident, like just get out of your home and she uh, has lost its evidence and uh, social practices, uh, which uh, went unaware as if you were not an ethnologist, just like shaking hands uh, to say hello, uh, become uh, really points of uh, major uh, tension. Um, so we do not live in uh, normal conditions any longer. So the question I'd like to ask is whether this feeling of radical change uh, 
is really in tune with reality. Our first impression, uh, the strongest in the only one, is that the epidemic would take us into a new uh, anthropological and political uh, system or regime. It would transform our relationships with others. It would deeply alter the conditions of our life together. In, our, in my brief presentation, I would like to argue that uh, uh, our current epidemic situation and condition is very damaging for our lives and the quality of our human relations um, and the economy, of course, but it is by no means a system, an exceptional regime in the sense that it would uh, change our relationship uh, with others or change completely. To make things worse, I would even argue that the epidemic situation is a moment of truth which reveals uh, a specific and unpleasant aspect of our human relations. And to uh, not look too provocative, I will base my argument on a classical 17th century author, uh, which has been uh, a long uh, subject of investigation for me. This author is Thomas Hobbes, who was born at the end of uh, the reign of Elizabeth I and died in 1679 and who's uh, experienced a great deal of disasters and canal can calamities. He also uh, experienced the great London plague in 1655. So uh, this is how we uh, word things. The conditions in which uh, uh, we experience the current epidemic are not fundamentally different of the conditions uh, in which we normally uh, live. I know it's a little provocative, but I would like to defend myself because it may seem a little strange because how can I argue that things are not so different from what they were yesterday, whereas everything seems to have changed. So let me try to explain what I mean um, uh, using uh, Hobbes to support uh, uh, my point. Now, let me remind you uh, what I mean to say. The, the question is to know whether the epidemic changes the very nature of our uh, social and political interactions. To answer this question, I'd like to come up to two series of comments. First, try to convince you that Hobbes is the right author uh, to understand the relationship between fear, trust, and risk. And then I'll move on to a second set of points to defend the idea that Hobbes' ideas on fear and consciousness are actually confirmed by the current pandemic conditions. Now, uh, first, uh, very briefly, uh, 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 is a chapter that would uh, entitle Hobbes and Street Stages, Fear, Trust, and Risk. People who don't know anything about Hobbes at least know that he held a rather scandalous uh, thesis uh, whereby we are not driven to each other by a taste for social relation, but quite the contrary, by the fear of others. So Hobbes' basic uh, predicate is that we as human beings are uh, fearful animals. How can you say such an absurd thing? Will you uh, reply, if I fear other people, then I will not try to associate with others. I will flee from them. Them. If hypothesis were to be true that at least uh, e, that we are fearful beings and not social beings, then we would all live in the woods and we would avoid uh, crossing our neighbors. Uh, yet, I believe it is Hobbes who is right when he underlines the fact that a number of social interaction is uh, uh, derives not from love for others but of fear. Sometimes we tend to confuse two feelings uh, that are associated with fear. On the one hand, um, the type of fear that leads us to being careful, to prudence, and another type of fear, which is sheer panic. Panic, of course, uh, makes us flee. But if you think a little uh, longer, the careful fear of prudence uh, would lead you to have good relationships uh, uh, with others. Uh, and we have a good example of that uh, in On the Citizen, uh, famous text by Hobbes. Uh, we have a, a, a vivid image in the three types of association with others uh, uh, when we do politics, when we do uh, business, 
or when we're looking for some sort of entertainment. What really motivates us is not love for others, but true consideration that have to do with our relationship with ourselves, uh, i.e. self-interest and the search for reputation. On this last point, anyone who has even a very limited practice of social networks, and I'm sure that many of you have such practice of no social networks, immediately understand what hubs mean. And as to the first point, that of self-interest, uh, uh, the minute you start doing any kind of business, uh, you understand uh, he's right. So the fear uh, has nothing to do with the existential uh, anguish. To reply what uh, Mrs. Bonnie uh, was saying, that has nothing to do with the uh, existential angst. The passion of fear Hobbes refers to is a passion. Uh, the interpreter will be sorry, but the, the sound is very uh, unsteady. So we are led to uh, associate when the conditions of trust exist. Uh, so if it were existential anguish or angst, we would try to understand uh, the nature, uh, our nature as human beings, whereas uh, uh, that other fear Hobbes uh, talks about, we are uh, motivated to associate with others, provided the preconditions for trust uh, are met. Now, if a fear is a natural feeling in humans, i.e. Uh, Hobbes in uh, theory, well, for Hobbes, uh, uh, human beings are naturally phobic. Uh, therefore, trust uh, in the reverse uh, implies artificial uh, conditions. Uh, so fear is a natural feeling. Trust is an artificial construct. Mm -hmm. uh, trust is something that you have to build. This is something uh, we say uh, regarding interpersonal relationships, but it's even more so in the case of you know relationships between a greater number of people, i.e. political uh, relations. So the state, uh, before being an administrative structure, state is the name of the condition whereby we can start establishing relationships based on trust. Hobbes considers uh, that the prerequisites of trust are provided by the fact that there is a power in charge of ensuring peace via laws, in other terms, a sovereign state. Now, let me draw your attention on the fact that the problem we are dealing with now is, is broader. It is that of the relationship between trust and fear. And of course, there are other ways to solve the problem than the one uh, put forward by Hobbes. So let's move a little further. So we understand what uh, fear means for Hobbes, and that's relationship between fear and trust. Now, what is the relationship between trust and risk? Now, if our relationships with others are based on fear, then, of course, you will say that it's very difficult to establish any kind of relationship. And the fear... Uh, the, the sound is, is, is very unsteady again. Uh, so anyway, the fear for Hobbes is the fear to be disappointed by others. And his political and moral thesis that we need a strong structure, in other terms, the state, to introduce trust. In other terms, uh, human associations are based on weak links. Many of you might not understand clearly, so let me uh, specify immediately what Hobbes means. In some cases, There are extremely strong relationships on, for which we are ready to risk our lives. But I hope say that we can't base uh, trust for our own ordinary associations, whether friends, family, on the only force of feelings. So Hobbes' thesis is an anti-romantic uh, thesis, a thesis that even hostile to romanticism in politics. And this is also the reason why uh, I wanted to say the following. Hobbes is an author 
who was was not considered a likable uh, 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 author. Now, let's see how all this relates to our epidemic. Uh, what I was trying to say, to put it simply, is that Hobbes helps us to think, to discuss things. The, the pandemic helps us understand what Hobbes was talking about. The, the, the link between uh, fear, trust, and risk is confirmed and not contradicted by the conditions of the current epidemic. You have a first confirm confirmation in the fact that contagious diseases are caught via others, uh, turn others into a reasonable uh, source of fear. If you shake hands with someone, or if you talk uh, uh, to someone without a mask and too close, you, might, you may uh, uh, transmit the virus if you're a, a bearer of the virus. So transmission by contagion changes our relation uh, with others in the sense that they become more phobic. Unfortunately, the connection with Mr. Fueno is very bad and keeps on chopping. We are, therefore, in a position where we have to behave with others as if we were all carriers of the virus. Unfortunately, Mr. Fuano's connection is very bad. In times of epidemics, we are equal as potential contaminants, equally susceptible to contaminate the other. And there is He says that to come out of this untenable situation, we need a structure, an organization known as the state, which is why, incidentally, his main book is The Leviathan, something that will scare us just as Leviathan scared people in antiquity. We need the state to coordinate our actions. And that's precisely true in, at the time of an epidemic. Had we the time, and that's not the case here today, we could say that the state, to do, discharge its due to, must Im, instill a specific political fear that Hobbes calls and the, the connection has cut again. Which brings me to my conclusion. The link between fear and trust is in fact confirmed by the current epidemic situation. We are fearful. The appearance of the virus hasn't made us fearful, but has revealed uh, some human traits. The simple fact that we need So, health, logic, and political logic in a time of sovereignty. You can summarize what I have said in the following way. Or maybe not. 
Our equality as potential carriers of the virus has led to a rational fear which, uh, in turn, leads to the perfectly reasonable under, uh, will and wish to come out of a state of constraint. So, to have confidence and trust, we have to have the right kind of mechanism that will uh, instill in all an equal fear. The fear of the virus would not be able, in and of itself, to force us to abide with health by health rules if it did not also rely on our fear of the state. I would like to finish off by showing you an illustration of what I mean, and I hope you will be able to see it on the screen. This, for instance, is the cover page of the uh, cover of the Leviathan in its 1651 edition. You can see here a big m character with all sorts of small characters inside it. It's the title page, uh, the individual uh, is very interesting to analyze, but I haven't got enough time to do so. But I think to confirm my thesis, that the author may have thought uh, the uh, conditions of politics in a time of epidemic. But just look at uh, this uh, tiny detail that I've uh, circled in yellow here. Maybe Tara can show me the second uh, picture I wanted to show you. And you'll see that these two tiny characters have a uh, black cloak and have also a mask with a large nose or beak. You should be able to see them there. So these two characters, these two individuals are um, plague doctors as uh, they were in London in 1666 in the, in the uh, great plague that killed 75 thousand people in London. Lastly, and this is taken uh, from uh, an article by Francesca Falk, my colleague, here you have the doctors as they were dressed here, uh, a big cloak and uh, the beak mask. They were the ones who went and cared for uh, patients during the um, plague. Now, Hobbes didn't design this, but having these plague doctors clearly show us uh, subtly that, in fact, uh, Hobbes's thinking does rely on the changes that epidemics uh, uh, produce in the behavior of uh, urban residents. So, Hobbes is really showing us what the epidemics do to our uh, human relations, and that was my uh, theory that I wanted to submit for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, I'm just navigating the, the technology here. Give me a second. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for that. I, I do have a question that I would like to ask you, um, but I want to make sure that we get time for some other questions um, first. In fact, one of our participants, Julian, asked um, that you say that the pandemic makes us fear others. It also emphasizes our dependence on others. Don't we have as much reason to reply with hope than with fear? Thank you. Yes, the question is, uh, indeed, whether we couldn't have hope in the epidemic. Well, look at the facts. What's our initial reaction when we learn, as Camus did in La Peste, and I know, uh, Jamie, that you read Camus, very carefully, and then the connection broke again. 
So I'd say that the first reaction is indeed uh, fear, but the subsequent reaction is how are we going to bring about once again the right conditions for trust with the people around us? And that's clearly a Hobbesian approach. Fear is something of a passion that goes together with reason, and on that basis, we will be start. We will think about how we will restore trust despite the epidemic. Now, where I live, despite the first lockdown, there were students who really were uh, in a very difficult position, didn't have uh, much to eat, hadn't been able to go back and rejoin their families. Obviously, we didn't wait uh, until the government did something. We uh, sort of collected uh, foodstuffs and shared it. And in times of disasters, national disasters, people tend to be afraid first and then restore uh, the conditions of trust. Now, if uh, what Julian refers to when he says hope is restoring the conditions of trust, then I fully agree with him. Thank you. Um, so someone else had asked, um, do, do these links to Hobbes' thought, do you think they vary according to the nature of the political regime in which these responses to the epidemic are taking place? Does it make a difference if the sovereign that needs to be appealed to is a democracy, for example, or a dictatorship? For him, there can be very, indeed, uh, different regimes. And um, making sure and there are other regimes, the tyrannical ones, where, in fact, uh, the feeling of fear is instilled into uh, the citizens. Montesquieu in the uh, L'Esprit des Lois uh, says that very clearly. And I think the question is perfectly uh, valid and essential. Having a state is vital for Hobbes, but he does also know and is very much aware of the significance of the public policies that are so very different depending on the nature of the regime. All right, thank you. Um, we have another question from Sebastian Munier, um, and this is for you and also um, Tanella Bonny. Um, and he asks, does Hobbesian politics resemble what Achille Mbembe calls the apolitics of the initiate? Uh, um, word because my connection is not so good. Just uh, I understand uh, uh, the 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 question used by uh, uh, the author. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I can send you the. Okay, do you hear better now? Do you hear me better? No, yeah, okay, but I mean I, I don't know the author, uh, Achille Mbembe, I, I don't know him very well, so I, I can't answer that question properly. Uh. Okay, okay, that's, that's a fair um, response. And then okay. I guess, lastly, we've got about five more minutes before we to move on. Um, yeah. And so I was curious, you had said to me um, in, in private conversation that in, in thinking about this presentation, you had gone back to Camus La Peste. Um, and it had helped you sort of think about this. Yeah. So I was curious what stood out to you. My read of Camus is that he, he comes away with a very different um, sense of, of human nature and, and what's possible than Hobbes seems to suggest. And so how did your read of Le Pest um, inform your thinking about this? And I guess most specifically, um, where do you think he goes wrong? Uh, je ne sais pas. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Jeff. 
Thank you, Jamie, for this uh, interesting question. I'm. It is a very interesting novel and a splendid one. I think Camus' assessment uh, is very relevant when he looks at the transformation of uh, human relations when uh, they move from being in a state of trust and confidence in the city of Oran and how things change. And he describes that very clearly, the way that the people's mindset changes and how their relations with others change. I also, much like the way uh, Camus describes the way in which people don't want to believe that the state the situation they're in isn't that dangerous. Now, at the beginning, they're all saying, ah, it'll just uh, blow over. And in fact, uh, we're doing the same here. Uh, that, uh, yes, uh, lockdown will soon finish and we'll come back to normal. I think, in fact, uh, what Camus is looking at and what he's doing is, in fact, criticizing the humanistic uh, illusions that we may have. Uh, Camus' purpose might be to try and understand how uh, this idea that, in fact, we are civilized individuals trusting in one another and that that would be self evident, whereas Hobbes's issue is to try and show us that and the uh, relation, uh, the connection broke, broke again. And this means that we can sh think about what we should do to make sure that the political circumstances in times of a plague will change in a way that we will be able to restore trust despite the plague being active in the city. So Camus' approach is not so much uh, a political issue, whereas Hobbes is looking at what we can do when the plague, or COVID in this case, uh, is at large, and what we should do through our political systems to preserve uh, our cooperation. I don't know if that um, is something you can agree to, and Jamie, but um, I, I do feel that their, their purpose isn't quite the same. Okay. Um, I would love to discuss this um, in more detail with you, but unfortunately, um, given the time constraints, we, we have to um, move on. Um, but yes, thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Art Ut Rosa. He is a German sociologist and philosopher and teaches at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. He is part of a new generation of thinkers working in the wake of critical theory or the Frankfurt School. In 2010, Art Mut Rosa published Alienation and Acceleration, a, th a synthesis of his reflection on social acceleration that he links to the Marxist idea of alienation. He is one of the 35 thinkers who influenced the world, chosen by the new literary magazine in December 2018. He is also the sponsor of the UNESCO Chair in Philosophy with Children at the University of Nantes. Welcome, Art Mut. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for this uh, kind introduction. I, I hope you can hear me, yes. Uh, yes. Yes, and thanks for the invitation to this uh, interesting uh, conference. I, I think it's really important to have something like a World Philosophy Day, uh, because I think it, it, it thinks about the connection between philosophy and the world. And I take philosophy really to be the mode in which we reflect on our relationship with the world, right? With the world we're living in and we're, with the world we're living to, so to speak. The a great uh, French uh, philosopher and phenomenologist uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, uh, he says that we we always uh, we live 
être au monde. We, we being in the world means being to the world and from the world and within the world, so to speak. And that's what I want to, uh, to do, really. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to develop a philosophy of our relationship to the world, so to speak, a self-world relationship. It doesn't start from the idea that there is a subject and the subject experiences a world, but who the subject is, how we form ourselves, how, how we experience ourselves and, and, and who we are actually always depends on the relationship towards what we perceive to be around us and uh, and, and, and uh, face to face with us right so uh, so the relationship towards the world is is, is is primary and covid of course this crisis the virus makes us rethink and actually re-experience it right what does it mean to be in the world today to live in this world to be to the world and uh, basically i think fear is always a basic element of uh, being in the world and to the world, right? Because, I mean, there, I think there are kind of two impulses of movement. One is desire. Some things out there seem to be attractive, right? So um, on the one hand, we are lured into the world, right? Things are attractive. On the other hand, they are the opposite of attractive. They are repulsive, so to speak. And that's when fear comes in. Something is dangerous or not good for us also. So I think it's the dialectics between desiring things out there and shying away from them for actually for varying reasons. Fear is a maybe too blank a too blanket a term, but uh, it's quite quite maybe quite useful to start by thinking uh, through it. And uh, now uh, now uh, the, the interesting thing is how is this uh, relationship changed uh, uh, due to the virus, uh, the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus? And uh, my my claim here is uh, actually that it's a uh, a very interesting thing what's happening because the basic modern mode it's become made actually it's become kind of the global mode right of being in the world and being to the world is the attempt to make it controllable dis disponible so to speak in, in french right because that's the title of the of the book is uh, of the small book i've just written is rendre le monde indisponible in french but uncontrollability in english and what i have in mind there it, it, it really fits very very uh, neatly with what COVID does to us or what we do to COVID. Because I think the main stance of modernity towards the world, modernity as a social formation, which has now kind of become, a, it's influencing our way of living and being to, in and to the world in a global level. And the main stance is trying to achieve control, making the world available, attainable and accessible, increasing the horizon of what we of what we can control, what we can command, but also what we can attain and access and uh, make available, right? And the interesting thing is that now, and of course we, we've done this through science. We want to know how things work, but also to, uh, through technology, we want to control them, even militarily, right? And in other ways, of course, uh, when you think of it in a global uh, um, level, it's, it becomes very evident. It's this attempt to have political control over the world, legal control, and, and so on. And um, the, the interesting thing is that now COVID is the kind of, I call it the monster of indisponibility, of non-controllability, right? It's like almost like the, re like some would could call it nature's revenge. I'm not sure whether it's nature's revenge, but it's the symbol, the manifestation of the fact that the world, that life can never be made completely controllable. But uh, COVID or the, the, the coronavirus, right, is the exact opposite of disponibility or, or of availability, attainability, accessibility. Why do I think so? Well, because we have not really, we don't have a, before, before, before March, right? There was no scientific knowledge of it at all. We didn't know anything about the virus because it probably didn't even exist, at least not in the human habitat, right? And we have no medical control over it. So far, there is no vaccine, there's no medicine to cure it. It's uncontrollable, right? And of course, it's uncontrollable technologically, it's uncontrollable uh, in its economic consequences, and it's uncontrollable politically. I mean, that's what politicians do, right? Or what we do as societies, we try to do everything we can to regain control, to make this thing, right? 
controllable, available, attainable, accessible, which means we need to understand it. We need to identify it in every single person, probably, right? We need to understand how it spreads and then gain a, a mastery over it, technical control, like epidemic control, political control, scientific control, and so on. But so far we experience it as, as, the, as the monster, as I call it, of indisponibility or uncontrollability of the thing which we cannot control. And actually this non-controllability has another side which is very frightening to us right so the world is really changing in our everyday experience because the non-controllability the indisponibility of of the virus is also in uh, it's also something we experience on the individual level because i cannot see it i cannot hear it i cannot smell it or touch it i don't know where it is but that's a very frightening situation but the idea is now you know, I ask, how do we relate to the world? Also on an everyday level, I go out, I walk through the streets, and now it is the feeling there's something in the air which I cannot see, which I cannot hear, which I do not smell, which I cannot control, right? But which might be deadly or at least very dangerous to me, right? And um, as uh, we've heard before, uh, it, it, of course, the danger is that this thing might already be in your body right in the body of the stranger or the child next to me it might be already in the body of my own child or it might be in my own body so i think on a very basic level of experiencing the world of being to the world and of acting in the world it has of course created a form of fear which i would even call ontological insecurity right we cannot trust our, the stranger we cannot trust our even our neighbors we cannot even trust our own bodies and our own forms of perception and you can see it you know it's kind of manifested it's symbolized it becomes visible and you know it becomes visible and and, and feelable now in the fact that uh, you know breathing actually is the most basic way of experiencing the world of being in the world and to the world because we breathe in the world and we breathe it out and now, the, and now we have to wear a mask between ourselves and the world, right? So that is really the symbol, the manifestation, the physical experience of I cannot trust the world outside and I cannot even trust my own, my own breath, right? It might, it might be deadly or poisonous for the others. So I think there is a kind of, there is a, kind of um, um, a very deep insecurity. And of course, you could call it fear. There's fear in the way I am in the world. And I'm not surprised that this fear also translates sometimes and somehow to the political level. Because if I cannot even trust my own perception, if I cannot trust my neighbors, why should I trust the government, particularly in a situation where science says, well, we don't know yet either, right? So I think there is, on the one hand, there is deep distrust. On the other hand, as some have mentioned in the discussion before, this might actually also be a situation when new trust and solidarity is born, because in a you know in a in a world which is completely regulated as our world is, and and routinized, uh, for everything there is someone responsible. There is a, a, a rule or um, um, an, an administration who is uh, which is responsible. But when things break down, the chains of interaction don't work anymore. The routines no longer work. Then this might be the point where we start to rethink again. Let's do it together. Let's think of new ways how um, to deal with this. Right? And, and, and the other big thing, which I find really interesting when you think of how do I experience the world, uh, this corona crisis, the COVID crisis, has for the first time in a, in a, in a long, uh, in for, for the first time in a long stretch of time, created something like joint attention on an almost global level, right? People everywhere in the world, in China, in Japan, in the Ivory Coast, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Latin America, in Europe, they are all kind of focusing on this threat, on the invisible threat right, of the COVID crisis. And it's even a kind of joint emotion because, because the reactions are very similar all over the world, right? There's on the one hand distrust. If I don't see it, maybe it's not even there. But there is also the idea of protecting yourself with a mask, social distancing, and so on. So maybe it's the birth of a, of a, of a period or at least of a, of a worldwide global awareness with joint attention and joint emotion and hopefully joint action. But how should we act? And I would like to finish. I have a few more minutes, I see. And by, 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 by uh, telling you what I have in mind, namely that this situation 
of uh, uncontrollability of the world, right, is something we experience on all other levels too. I believe this is the global crisis. I believe modernity, the, the social formation, I would call the modern social formation, is in a deep crisis because this program of making the world controllable, right? Available, attainable, accessible, but commanding it, dominating it, controlling it, always has the flip side of breeding monsters of non-controllability. Let me give you a, a, a few very small examples. Like think of how we have come to acquire nuclear power, right? We have come to control matter from the inside. We can split the atom that is increasing our power, almost making our, ourselves omnipotent. But this has created the monster of the nuclear explosion of the bomb or the, or the, or the power station, which, which is blowing up. So we feel totally powerless. It's a loss of total control. And I think this characterizes our situation in the, in the natural sphere anyway. We have come to control nature on so many levels, right? We, we have uh, explored it scientifically, but we can also we, we extract it from the earth, right? And we control it and we use the forces of nature. But this creates the monster of the climate disaster, of global warming, where we feel completely powerless. I can't do anything. Right? And I believe even politically, this is very relevant, right? Because the idea of democracy, global sovereignty, popular sovereignty is the idea that we, the people, have become kind of omnipotent. We can do everything politically. But the experience, for example, in the face of Brexit or so, it's that we are powerless because the financial markets are too strong or the, 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 the global economy and so on. Uh, so it's always this kind of flip side of trying to be in control of everything and really getting a long way there and then experiencing total powerlessness. And my final example is uh, in our everyday private lives, we have the same experience. We have become almost omnipotent with a remote control in the smart home, let's say, right? So it's one click and it's getting very bright light in the room. It's one click and it's getting really warm and it's one click and there is loud music. So, and I can even change the color. It's blue or green or, or, or whatever, purple, right? When, when with one click, so I'm kind of omnipotent. But if the battery fails or the electricity, somehow the system fails, I cannot open the window. I cannot close the door. I cannot sh uh, turn off the radio, for example, right? I become totally powerlessness. So we talked about trust. And I believe what COVID might teach us is it's philosophy, right? Is that there is two ways of trust. One, one element of trust is I am in control of everything. And I think this program fails. You cannot be in control of everything. And by the way, the disprivileged on a global level and in our, all of our societies, they know this very well. They are not so, in my, in my experience, my observation, they are not that, that afraid uh, for, uh, of, the, of the COVID virus because they have already learned, they had to learn that they cannot control their lives, right? While some on the upper levels, the, the, the global elites, they, they were still living on the illusion we can have everything under control. So now we realize it's, I believe we realize it's a complete illusion to think you can control all the situations that, that can come to you. But of course, I'm not advocating the opposite fatalism. I cannot control it anyway. But there is a different way of trust. It's not the, the self-efficacy in the sense I control everything. It's and 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 uh, uh, the uh, 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 Tanella Boni has talked about that uh, too, if I understood her correctly, saying that there is a different way of trusting, namely, I I cannot. I don't know what will come, what the world has in store for me. I don't know what will happen next, but I trust that I, together with others, will find an answer, that I can react to it and, and deal with the situation. Right? So I really hope, my hope is that we as a society uh, develop a new way of living and working in this world, uh, developing self-efficacy in the sense of let's deal with the problems that they are there. Let's try to find solutions, but on a pragmatic level, right? Uh, listening and answering instead of dominating and controlling. That's what I, what I want to do philosophically. And I still have some hope that COVID might help us to get there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ahmed. I really appreciate that. Um, as, as you're talking, um, the, the thought that keeps coming to mind is the very famous line by, by Gramsci that the, 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 the trouble is that the old is dying and the new mm -hmm. has not yet been born. 
And I was just wondering how that fits into your analysis and, and the current confusion we're having. It seems like part of the political failure to respond to this adequately is at least in part due to this refusal to let the old die, to continue to insist that we can live our lives as we've been living them, um, as opposed to creating new alternatives of, of living in the world and relating to each other and organizing society. So I was curious what you, what you thought about that. Yeah, I think you're, you're completely right there. I mean, even though we somehow realized, actually, I mean, I think it's very important to keep in mind that the old normal, right, the state of the world or of our lives before uh, COVID wasn't such a great sta uh, 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 state of affairs, right? The old normal was very problematic already, right, with, with because of global warming issues, because of democratic failure issues, because of global injustice issues, right? But in, in a term of crisis like the one we have now, it seems like that most people really, and, 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 and most politicians also, right, try to get back as fast as possible to the old normal, to a very uh, problematic state. And of course, that is due to the, to, the, to, to the reason that it's very hard to see what the new will be, right? I mean, th that's this old discussion, whether we can see the shape of the new be, be, before we let the old die, right? What, what has to come first, right? And probably people don't want to let the old die to, 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 to uh, go away from the old normal if they don't see what the new normal could be. And I, but I have some hope in Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher, right? She, she has this conception of natality. She says, what is really the distinguishing feature of human beings is that we are not forced. We do not have to continue along the old uh, bad, <laughs> along the old tracks, right? Uh, but we have the capacity to, to let the new be bo being born. But I, I think what we, really, what we need to do to, um, to see the new being born is to give up this old very problematic idea of trying to, to control everything. Thank you. Um, so a question from one of our participants um, is, has the pandemic slowed down the acceleration or does it inevitably accelerate the global integration that comes with this acceleration? Yeah, that's a very interesting question really because I think it's obviously true uh, that the pandemic uh, uh, did slow down the world. I mean, on a just on a physical material level, you could actually, you could measure it even uh, in uh, geopolitics, right? The seismolo seismologists say that the, the movement over the earth, right, has kind of slowed down because 95%, up to 95% of the air traffic has slowed down and uh, more uh, inner cities some uh, uh, during uh, at least March and April, Traffic has been down by up to 85%. And even now on German highways, for example, even, even though Germany does not have a complete lockdown, traffic is only up to about 50%. So it's a material and physical slowdown, which of course doesn't always feel good, right? I mean, if you're laid off, for example, if you're out of work, you're slowed down, but it's a very, it's a dysfunctional slowdown. It's an enforced uh, uh, slowing down. But of course we kind of, you know, what we have done is we have increased the speed on the digital level, like what we are doing right now. I mean, a, a bit later, directly after this conference, I will have to give a, um, a talk at, in Guadalajara in Mexico, in, in Mexico. So I could not have done that before. So there is digital acceleration well, there is physical slowdown. And this is something that the French philosopher and, and uh, sociologist Paul Virilio predicted actually in the 1980s. He said uh, the, the end of this situation will be polar inertia or frenetic standstill. We will not move anymore, right? Because today I, I hardly move. I always have to look into the camera and speak into the tiny microphone. So I will not physically, I'm totally slowed down, but digitally I'm kind of spinning like mad <laughs> around the world. So I think it's this dialectics, the, the split between the real physical movement and the, and the digital movement has vastly increased. And, uh, and we don't know what will come out yet, but I still, I do, I do think we also experience how important our physical experience uh, is so maybe maybe the result will not be a complete digitalization of our world but a, a heightened awareness of our of the fact that we are physical embodied beings yeah well i certainly hope we don't move to an exclusively digital way of interacting although like you i'd never be able to do this were it not for this expansion of of relating to one another digitally um, we don't have any more questions currently from any of the participants. Um, so I guess I will just 
ask you the questions that I have myself while I have the luxury and we have some more time. Um, you talk about this notion of ontological insecurity. Um, and I'm curious if, if you could maybe flesh that out a little bit more and how COVID has not so much changed the nature of our insecurity, but made all of us sort of aware of, of the fact that that exists. Yeah, I mean, I take the concept of uh, ontological security from Anthony Giddens, right? But it's Donc, also... je prends le concept de sécurité ontologique. Uh... Okay, uh, so it's but it's around in philosophy in, 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 in different ways. And the idea is just that there is a basic level of trust that the, that the, for example, the, the, the earth under my feet will not open up and, and kind of suck me in or so, right? And of course, part of this, uh, there are some things which we just trust. And of course, one of the things uh, we, we always trusted is that we can breathe the air freely, right, without uh, worrying that we poison ourselves through this. And normally, if you meet someone, if someone says, oh, hello, or if you kind of embrace your friends, you normally, it's kind of ontological security. He will not kill me, for example, right, if you uh, embrace someone. And uh, so if all of a sudden this, these are kind of things you were always secure about, right, become highly risky, potentially deadly, right? Then your basic relationship towards the world is changing. And I think, uh, and, and you're right. I mean, my, my claim was, I mean, look at something, if you think of something like the European Union, right? We, we kind of, and, 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 and many aspects of the political world, for example, that we are moving towards free markets, right? But they were just taken for granted. And then someone like Donald Trump comes along and he just imposes new uh, uh, tariffs, right, on, on, on trades or so, and he just leaves, he just cancels legal international treaties and so on. So things which were absolutely taken for granted, which we did not even think about, all of a sudden become questionable. You can no longer be sure that you will not have a bomb on your head or so. I, I mean, many people will tell you that was always their uh, uh, everyday experience, but so far we thought, the, these forms of insecurity, when you cannot be sure whether you will die by a bomb or by a virus tomorrow, right, should be something that we can uh, systematically overcome, right? It's only something that we have to deal with and on the fringes of uh, society. And now we all of a sudden realize, I mean, it's the most drastic experience we, we maybe can have of it, that, uh, that, that life is in a certain sense always uncontrollable, right? So my, so my hope is that we gain a kind of, let's call it second order ontological security, right? Uh, that I no longer believe I'm in control of everything, but that, 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 that I have the feeling that yeah, even though I do not know what will happen next, right? Or I, I, at least I, 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 I'm aware that things can always change. I trust in my own capacity, but also of course in our collective, because we can only do this together, in our collective capacity to find answers and, and react to this. So then would, would you agree then with Tanela Bonnie that um, Seneca and the Stoics can provide some useful guidance in, in navigating our way forward through here? Or would you object to that? No, I think I, I think it might, it might certainly be an, an, an interesting way of turn, uh, going back to the uh, to to the uh, antiquity and and those uh, philosophers. But as I said before, I mean, my, you know, my idea is my my my, my uh, con the conception I, I developed is a conception of being in resonance with the world, and I think that's not exactly Seneca's or the Stoics' idea, because being in resonance means, you know, m what I really want to say is let's not try to control and dominate the world. Let's try to listen and respond. But in our response, there is also a sense of self-efficacy. Yes, we can do something. We have resources to live on, right? We are not just, we are not uh, condemned to uh, fatally live uh, with what is uh, coming uh, to us, but we, we develop a sense of actually also increasing our capacity to listen to not just to other beings, but to nature, to history, for example, right? To things and then being, being with them together, but not, you know, not just in a passive way, let's do what nature call, tells us, but let's be in a kind of dialogue with each other and the world. So it's, I think it's not exactly the Seneca and the Stoics approach, but, but we can certainly get inspiration from them. So with your sense of being in resonance with the world, it sounds like that would entail a, an entire rethinking of how humans understand their position in the world and, and what the world exists for. You mentioned both climate change and COVID, and these seem to be responses to human insistence that the world is for us, to be used for us. 
Um, and in, there's very much the sense in which one could un understand the, the world as saying like, no, this is, this is not working. This is detrimental. And so does your sense of being in resonance with the world sort of compel us to reevaluate where we understand ourselves to be in, in terms of global importance? Yes, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I, I really, uh, what I'm trying to get at is a different way of, it's, it's a different social formation, really, but it's very important to see that it's not just a change in philosophical position or our, our, our individual habitus, right? Because, of course, it is also, it's tightly connected to the institutional framework and fabric of modernity and with what, uh, what you can call capitalism, for example, capitalist markets, because in our current economic system, there is this need to speed up, to grow, to, to, to increase control and domination over the world, just in order to uh, to get to keep up our um, our institutional status quo, right? Otherwise, we lose jobs. We cannot pay the the taxes, the pensions. That we cannot um, entertain or uh, maintain the health systems and so on. So, so, so the I think the whole logic, not just the philosophy of modernity, but the whole institutional logic, is geared towards. It's it's kind of it's it's uh, it's created in the in the way of trying to gain control and, and being forced to permanently increase our hold over the world. So I'm I think we. Have, I, I believe modernity is in a very deep crisis and we need to rethink our formation on an institutional level somehow to overcome this logic this of the fine of, of a capitalist society driven by financial markets right because they force us to speed up to optimize in all respects and to always achieve growth and innovation at all costs this is what creates the 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 position you just uh, said it doesn't work you're you're right right the world is telling us well this attempt of gaining complete control and ever and always using everything to our individual purposes seems to not work so we need an institution and a cultural change. And of course, it's a long way to get there, but maybe something good comes out of this crisis and we make some progress. Awesome. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to read one that came through the, the Q&A. Um, and we're asked, do you think that based on the fact that we cannot trust our own basic sense to make sense of our world, the situation might teach us in some way that we have to cope with or solve the ecological urgency the air pollution, for example, that is almost 100% invisible to us for now? Or are we doomed to stay blind to the underlying problems of disease related to the environment? Is the fight against the virus also a fight against absurdity, against the nonsense of the virus? Our being in the world and also our search for sense and the mere existence of the virus, is this a questioning of our existence? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question, right? I think it's a questioning of our existence, but the question is on what level? And I, I'm, I'm as, as I said before, I'm inclined to say it's a questioning of our current, what I call modern way of being in the world, right? And maybe, you know, I mean, some, I was in, in France actually in a, in a, in a, at a philosophy conference also with Bruno Latour, and there some uh, virologists, biologists uh, tried to combine that with the uh, philosophical thinking from a Chinese tradition, and their idea was, was that the virus actually because it's not a living thing it's not a bacterium right it, they cannot reproduce themselves so it's very unclear what a virus is and the idea was that the virus actually is an indicator of a distortion in our way of being in the world and relating to the world so i think yes it's i i i'm almost inclined to read it as a sign of this distortion which you which is also of course connected to global warming and the other our, our uh, ecological disaster and i think since the virus forces us to really act right we might gain that that's my big hope because you know normally when you think of for example uh, there, there are always more and more airplanes more and more cars more and more trucks on more and more ships every year if you look at the two, 200 uh, years in the past every year no matter how many climate accords there were struck right there were more cars more planes more trains more uh, ships cruise ships container ships bigger ships and so on and Actually, our feeling was there's nothing we can do against it, right? We can talk about it, we can write books, we can have Fridays for future protestations, but in fact, nothing changes. But now, actually, the COVID crisis has proven that politics is capable of bringing down 95% of airplanes within a few days. It was not the virus who brought them down. It was political action in the face of a crisis. So I think we also got some uh, experience of political self-efficacy, and we might very well be able to use this in order to deal with the global climate crisis and other crisis crisis as well. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, that brings Thank us you. exactly to time. Um, so I want to introduce our last speaker. Um, our last speaker is Julian Bajini. Julian Bajini is a British philosopher, journalist, and author of over 20 books on philosophy written for the general public. He is co-founder of the Philosopher's Magazine and has written for numerous internet numerous international newspapers and magazines. In addition to writing on the theme of philosophy, he has also written books on atheism, secularism, and the nature of national identity. He is also a patron of Humanists UK. Julian, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you to UNESCO for inviting me. It's been a very interesting discussion so far. Um, I hope I can add something to it. I want to talk about, and I've got some slides to show, so you don't have to look at me too much throughout this. And I think we can perhaps put the first one up and I'll have Kathleen instruct when to go through, I believe. So do we have the first slide up? I can't see that. Okay. Well, I'll talk and then whoever's doing the slides can perhaps try and catch up with me. Um, I was going to begin by just talking about risk. I, I think that what I'm going to be talking about in this brief time is what this pandemic, I think, tells us about uh, the limits of human rationality and perhaps the mistakes we make about how reason works and how rational persuasion ought to work. And what I really want to start, it, want to start with was this idea that uh, yeah, we, one thing that's very clear is we're not very good at risk perception. Okay, So you can always see this in, in <laughs> the newspaper articles, magazine articles all the time which are giving these headlines like why you're probably not so great at risk assessment. This is the next slide. Why human brains are bad at assessing the risks of pandemics. And you see these in things like the New York Times, the Washington Post, as well as more specialist publications like Psychology Today and Psych Central. So, I mean, and that's kind of something that we just now, I think, accept about ourselves. We've learned we're very, very bad risk assessors. Um, that can lead people to take excessive risks for sure it can encourage people to behave in ways that they they shouldn't do because they don't understand the risks of going out without masks and so forth but as a slide after this shows it can also lead us to underestimate risks so there was this story here just a little silly story really from a british newspaper called the metro in which there's a beachgoer who says oh i he, i don't know anyone who's had coronavirus so it doesn't matter. You know, that idea that we, we assess the risk, not from any kind of objective, rational assessment of what's going on, but how things seem to us. And this is the next slide. And that therefore, if, if we don't see something bad going on, we just not, we don't, not very afraid of it, which is why, going back to something said previously, uh, you know, a pandemic can bring the planes down from the sky because the risk is immediate and evident, whereas actually, um, yeah, climate change, where it's much, much more important because we don't perceive the risks so directly and so emotionally, nothing is done about them. So our assessment of risk is very poor, um, and, but also associated with that, hope. We're not very good at hope. So let's take this uh, very famous quote from Jean-Paul Sartre, who said, we should act without hope. And what, what he meant was not that we should be absolute pessimists and expect anything not to work. It was simply the idea that actually when we set about trying to achieve some good, we don't know whether we're going to succeed. And that to act without hope is to act trying to bring about what we want to bring about, but without necessarily expecting that it will. I only know that whatever may be in my power to make it so, I shall do. Beyond that, I can count upon nothing. This is a realistic view of hope, I think. But uh, there are unrealistic views of hope, as the next slide, uh, unfortunately, illustrates um, the soon to be previous president of the United States, Donald Trump, do, famously has encouraged a kind of empty hope based not on reason at all, with his pronouncements such as one day, it's like a miracle, it will disappear, it's going away, we have it totally under control. These are things he said repeatedly. And that kind of like false hope, why does that appeal to people? Well, I mean, one reason is of course, hope is pleasant, it's nice to have it, but also, you know, we're just not very good at working out what is likely to happen. So we're likely to go with our feelings, not with our 
rational judgment. And this is deeply problematic. So when you put these two things together, if you think about how people think about hope and risk, and you think about how bad we are at both of those things, uh, you can end up with a very pessimistic conclusion. Uh, the next slide will give an example of that. Jonathan Swift said on more than one occasion, a few things which were very pessimistic about reason. Reasoning will never make a man correct an ill opinion, which by reasoning he never acquired. In other words, if the hopes and the fears we have do not have their roots in any kind of rational assessment, how can we hope for any kind of rationality to make us correct those things? And as he also said very memorably, reason is a very light rider and easily shook off. So I think the pandemic would seem to underline something which is repeatedly becoming said, repeatedly being said by experts, and it's becoming a kind of new common sense that human beings are not rational, and it is really beyond our capacity to correct our behaviours and attitudes by the use of reason. And if you're a philosopher and you value reason, that's not a very cheerful proposition. But I think that reflecting on this is not a reason to give up on reason, on rationality. It's rather an opportunity to reflect a little more about what it actually means to reason. And in particular, what it means to reason publicly, what it means to reason in such a way as to persuade people of things that are true, rather than to persuade them of the things that you want them to believe. My next slide shows Aristotle. Aristotle was, of course, one of the founding fathers of Western philosophy. And he described very famously the principles of rhetoric. And these are going to appear <laughs> as each click of the mouse comes up. First, logos. So this is the idea of reason. Logos is reason. That a good argument should be rooted in reason. But that wasn't the end of it. As a philosopher, he was not so naive as to think that persuasion only requires logos, reason. It requires two other things. The first is pathos, emotion. To persuade, you need to also connect with people's feelings. Now, this is very interesting because the way in which psychologists today talk about the human mind and human behavior, it would be easy to think that actually reason and feeling operate in parallel and they're unconnected. If you think about system one and system two thinking in the work of Daniel Kahneman. This has become very, very well known. The idea is that we have quick, hot, emotional responses, and we have slow, cold, rational responses. And it's like these two systems are completely separate. Well, Kahneman himself doesn't actually say they're completely separate, but that's the kind of message which has come through. I think what we appreciate actually is that uh, these things do affect one another. How you feel affects the way you think, how you think changes the way you feel. So for example, how afraid we are does depend on what we believe to be true about the thing we're afraid of. It can work the other way too. So rational persuasion, rational argument needs to connect reason and feeling and it can do that when it's done best. The third element is ethos, and this is extremely important. In order to be persuaded, we need to have a certain trust in the character of the person who is trying to persuade us. This isn't irrelevant. In the kind of philosophy I was trained in, we were told to ignore the philosopher, if you like, ignore the person. Uh, to, to criticize a position or for that reason to give it merit on the basis of who said it was known as the ad hominem fallacy. Well, actually, I think that's rather naive in a, a pure state, of course, um, such as you find perhaps in science. Then maybe there are occasions where you can completely disregard 
the nature of the speaker. In real life, the nature of the speaker is very important because reason, even evidence, these are things which can be manipulated. A very clever person can come up with a very clever argument for something which suits their own interests. What you want to know is not only that the person is so clever that they can make something look persuasive, but that they are sincere and honest and have integrity. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to take into account when assessing the reasonableness of arguments. Now, the next slide, I'm going to show how these three uh, principles of ethos and logos and pathos interact. And this is a way of sort of identifying a problem, but also perhaps a solution. So there are various people whose pictures will appear as the mouse is clicked. Maybe we can have the first click or two. So I think that on the positive side, um, we have people like, I think, Barack Obama and Jacinda Ardern, the New Zealand premier, who exemplify that kind of how it, this can still work. What Aristotle said was still true. You can have people who are seen as being of good character and integrity. They're also based their, what they say, on reason and argument, but they also have a way to connect with people emotionally. And these are inspirational, and the fact that such people do exist in our politics is a cause for hope. On the other hand, if we can see the next person to appear, there are people who appear simply to do, be effective because they appeal to pathos. And I'm looking at you, Donald Trump. It may appear to be that Trump is persuasive, but it can't be because of the rationality of his arguments, because I don't think it's controversial to say there is no rationality to his arguments. But he has a way of connecting with people's emotions, their fears in particular. He really does seize on people's fears. However, I think that actually what should disturb us is not so much that Trump's appeal is based purely on pathos. If we can see the next two people to appear in this diagram, Trump, I think, could also be placed in the intersection of ethos and pathos, along with perhaps Jai Bolsonaro of Brazil. Um, this is not to say that I believe these people are of good character, and that's why they can be trusted. There's a significant number of people who now believe that the virtues of character that are required to lead a nation are the kind of virtues they see in Trump and Bolsonaro. The virtues of being iconoclastic against the establishment, uh, independent minded, perhaps they might be seen. So it's extremely worrying, in fact, that a large proportion of the population seem to believe that these people represent good character. If we may have another two clicks. Um, so the first click will show Trump next to Bolsonaro, the next advance, and one more click will show this figure of the academic. Now this is not, this is a caricature, but unfortunately I think this is part of our problem. The academic, the scientist, the philosopher, they're seen as representing logos, and logos in this view is distinct from, it's certainly nothing to do with pathos, there is an inability of academic study to appeal to people on an emotional level. But I also think there is a distrust. People do not no, no longer trust the characters of academics. They believe they are a part of a self-serving liberal elite, that they are furthering their own interests, and there is a lack of trust in their character. So what are we to do about this? Well, I think, fortunately, the solution is quite <laughs> simple to describe, difficult to bring about. So the next slide simply shows us a little summary of what the current image of the intellectual and the academic is. And in, in analytic philosophy, which is dominant in a lot of the English speaking world, you have these diagrams as well. If we can go forward rather than back, that'd be great. Um, and, and I think this is, this is the problem. Reason, this is the image people have of reason and rationality. It's one where those other elements of ethos, of character, and of passion, of emotion, have been separated from it. And I think that's a key part of why it is not working and why people find it so difficult to enable to convey truthful messages 
which give an accurate idea of fear and risk and hope in ways that people understand. But there is hope, and my final slide perhaps will, will show this, illustrate this. The final slide um, is a representation of a Enlightenment salon in Paris, where UNESCO is based. This is the salon of Madame Buffleur, who uh, the great Enlightenment thinkers all uh, went to her home. They loved it. And Hume was a visitor there in late life. And the image of the salon is one of a humane reason. It's also about uh, civility. It's about enjoyment. It's about pleasure. And it's about conviviality. And Hume, who attended these, um, famously said, be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, still be a man. We would hope that today he would say, still be a human being rather than give us that gendered man. But this is, I think, what the pandemic is telling us about how academics and philosophy needs to recast itself to be of a benefit to the world. It needs to shatter and to challenge the, the image it has of a detached uh, enterprise well, conducted by people who have no concern other than for their own careers and their own professional development. I don't think this is accurate, but I don't think the Academy has been successful so far in correcting that image. And if we can do that, if we can find ways to speak to people in which reason is supplemented both by that demonstration of character and also can connect with people's feeling, then I think there is hope that despite all we are told, people can have a more rational assessment of what they should be afraid of what the risks are, and also what they can hope for. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Julian. Um, as someone with a background in analytic philosophy as well, um, I'm familiar with what you're talking about, that insistence to, to write and communicate in a way um, that is sort of cold and dispassionate and removed from our emotions. But you, you, were, you mentioned Hume at the end, um, who argues that we need to treat emotions almost as though there are sort of facts about our existence. Um, but what are some ways that we can sort of bridge this gap? While you were talking, I was thinking about how this related to the nature of, of the free speech debate and the limitations of, of rationality and making sense of that. I'm here in the US where we're handling the, the COVID pandemic in just about the worst way possible. Um, and people will insist with absolute conviction that masks makes no difference. And in fact, they will actually kill you um, because they limit your ability to breathe in oxygen. And so how do we make headway here when emotions can become so salient that they override facts and reason? And how do we strike that right balance by recognizing that there are these intense emotional responses, um, but that are divorced from anything that we could plausibly call rationality? Yeah, no, thanks. It's, it's a good question. I, I said in a sense, the, the general direction is simple enough to describe how to achieve it is very, very difficult. And, you're, you're, and one of the reasons it's difficult is it, be, it requires shifting a set of perceptions that have become quite deeply embedded. I think what you need to do is to ask, why are people so resistant to these rational messages? And I think the, there are two question, two answers to that, which are popular and not helpful. One is simply that human beings are stupid. The problem with this is that a lot of people who say that do not believe that they are stupid, of course. And the fact that human beings are stupid does not explain why only half the population uh, supports one proposition, which is supposedly stupid and not the other half. The other is that those people who disagree are, to use that unfortunate phrase, the deplorables. You know, the, the, the people who, who refuse to respond to what educated opinion says is the rational thing are just sort of somehow second class citizens or inferior. So I think you have to start by recognizing that people, there's, there's, there's something called the, the principle of charity in, in argument, which I think is, is really important which is that you should always 
try and interpret the beliefs and arguments and actions of others in ways which make most sense and not least sense. So you ask, why would someone who is no more stupid than the average human being uh, reach silly conclusions? And I think you have to recognize there are certain answers to that. One is that they do not believe these academics and experts are people who have their own interests in heart, other people's interests at heart. They think they are uh, self-serving. The second, and that is shown by the fact that when they talk to them, they often do talk to them in, in patronizing ways as though the people won't understand. And the other reason is that the, the, to the extent that people do have emotions and feelings here, they're not taken seriously. So, I mean, for example, if you, if we take the case of uh, in, in North America, I, I, I personally believe, and not everyone at this event will agree, I personally believe that a lot of what Donald Trump has, has argued for has, has no basis around economic policy. But you speak to people, you hear people who are from those, you know, the Rust Belt, all these former industrial places. And it is entirely reasonable that they have a fear that their jobs have gone, that imports will, will kill them, and that you know, there is nothing else to do other than to try and revive these old industries. If you don't understand that fear, then you can't engage with them uh, rationally. So I've sketched out a few things here, but I, I think it's really, in a way, it's simple. You have to kind of understand how it's not enough just to sort of talk to people as you would talk to them in a seminar you have to recognize, as Aristotle saw, that people have to recognize you as being of someone of, they can trust. And you also have to understand how they're feeling and speak to that as well. And it can be done. And this is why I had the hope of people like Obama and Arden in the political realm. They, they, they show it can be done. Thank you. Are there um, philosophers that you're familiar with who you think are doing this sort of work well and can serve as a model for the rest of us who might like to improve? Um, well, I think, I think there are. Um, it's difficult to, to name names. I mean, I think in particular, I have to, have to say I'm encouraged by a younger generation of philosophers. Um, when I started in philosophy, I think the general ethos was still a, quite a, a detached one. It was, you know, people, many people did, had no interest in talking to the general public at all. And if they did, it was in a somewhat um, superior manner. I think the younger generation uh, are very different. And I'll just mention one person because they're at the front of my mind, Misha Cherry, who's an American philosopher. She's, she's giving a talk for us in, in the UK, the Royal Institute of Philosophy, again online, so anyone can watch it later. And I've seen her talk before and I've seen other things she's done. And I think that she, she writes and talks about very difficult issues around things like race and gender, the kind of issues which are very divisive. But she does so in a way which I think it really sort of shows an understanding. You know, it's not about just telling people why they're wrong. It is about understanding. And so it's that combination, her manner and the content of what she's saying and the way she conducts herself, which is with civility and respect to other people, means she's someone who I think that anyone, I mean, a lot of people, of course, just wouldn't choose to listen to her because they've already decided she's an opponent. But if they did, they would, they would discover that not everyone who is arguing in favour of things like critical race theory um, despises <laughs> white working class men or wants to take away their culture and tradition, you know. So I think she's a very good example. Yeah, I, I, I would second that. I've assigned her this semester and I've had some pretty great success. Um, we, um, that wraps up my question. Is there anything else you'd like to l use the last few minutes to, to cover or direct our attention to that you think might be of some use in helping us make more rational sense of this topsy-turvy world that we're inhabiting? Okay, well, I think one thing that perhaps, again, academ academic life is slowly coming around to 
Um, I don't want to be too critical, by the way, of academic life. It's, it's very fashionable to criticize academics. Um, but the institutions of academic life over the past century have encouraged, I think, excessive specialization. And specialization is very important sometimes, and you do need specialists. But the, in the ecosystem of academia, um, I think the problem is it's too much focused on specialists and not on people who can bring things together. I think that when it comes to any issue of, of public importance and practical effect, you always need uh, a variety of expertises. I mean, in some ways, I would say that actually, I was, um, something said right at the beginning by Tanella, which was about um, the idea of human, the relationality of human beings. That's a kind of something I've become much more aware of in recent years, that the archetypal Western thinker is the solitary thinker. It's Descartes' meditations alone in his room. It's Rodin's statue like this. Whereas actually thinking is something which is at its most successful when it's collaborative. It requires bringing people together. And I think that when people are skeptical of ex expertise, which they often are, in some ways they're kind of right in the sense that when, you, when a single individual or even a single discipline claims at, for itself expertise over matters which have wide social concern, that's almost in invariably wrong. The true expert is really a collective you know, to solve, uh, to solve this uh, pandemic problem, you need to bring together individuals with different specialisms and combine their expertise. Um, something it sounds like Joe Biden is, is trying to do in, in, the, in the States and hopefully will be successful in. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's about trying to facilitate that kind of cross-fertilization and not just deepening our knowledge in particular areas, but trying to work out how to bring these things most fruitfully together. And if you think about it, I mean, do you know of any major academic institution which has what you might call a professor of synoptic studies, someone whose only job it is, is to kind of join the dots between the different expertises in the universities? I don't know of one. I think every department, every university, should have dozens of them actually, <laughs> because without them, there's just a lot of knowledge which is being lost because it's only being heard within, within the discipline. So I think that's a big, big challenge for um, academic and scholarly life. Well, to answer your question, no, I am not familiar <laughs> with a university that has such a department, um, but I just want to thank you again for participating and Tanella and Luke and Art Moot. Um, we are just about out of time. And so again, thank you to everyone for participating and spending your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you happen to be time zone with us today. Big thank you from the National Thanks a lot. Merci beaucoup thank you for contributing to uh, the world philosophy days thank you merci thank you <laughs> thank you au revoir Bye-bye. <laughs>